Welcome back to the Cream Spot, aka Little Dicks Anonymous. I'm here with my favorite co-host, the Rob Diggity Dangle Dog. Uh, I'm completely dying over this. <laughs> it's a picture. You're meaning our, our, you're, you're our friend, me- our friend Jonathan Ellinger posted <laughs> it. It's, it's a picture of Goldberg Spear and Bray Wyatt. But it's I don't on a, like it. I don't it's, like it already. It's on it's on a Pornhub thing, and it says "Granddad pounds BBW Juggalo" <laughs> oh, while everyone Christ. watches. <laughs> you send me that link, I'd click on it for sure. <laughs> exactly, and that's the biggest Whew. atrocity committed by the WWE yeah. this week. Is what a sham. Let Bray Wyatt lose to Bill Goldberg, but we're not going to bore you with wrestling talk because not all of you are wrestling fans like us. Fucking Goldberg, you fucking <clears throat> jerks. We have a very special episode. This is a Patreon-sponsored episode. Thank you to Brandon Party for sponsoring this episode. Yeah, thank you. And on the top of our list here for Patreon sponsors, Angie pledged last week, and she said, don't let the pledge go to me. I would like for you guys to give the shout-out to my fiancé, Kevin Underwood. And I said, okay. Sure. And then she said, He's a finger in the booty, bitch. I said, oh. even better. So, Kevin, he likes the golden nugget to be flipped. Thank you so much for listening to the Brohio Podcast. You are at home with us, Kevin. Yeah, whether you get milked or not. Don't be ashamed to no. have that little crunchy nugget pushed on. Unless you have puffy nipples. That is the cream spot right there. That, that really is. And, uh, yeah, exactly what Rob said. Kevin, if you have puffy nipples, turn us off. <laughs> We're not interested in your, in your uh, download. Yeah, it's okay if you like your, your milk dud diddled. That's all right. Yeah, and thank you to Melissa Cooper for your Patreon pledge. Yeah, Emily Carroll, why not? Thank you, too. And um, Amanda Hudek. I could probably go a lot of different directions with that one, but Amanda Hudek, thank you for your Patreon pledge. And Cody Goff, thank you. And I got a really (laughs) fucked up name here. (laughs) There you go. Connor (laughs) Sakakakosia. Coronavirus. Uh, Connor Sakakasia. How do you even say that? That's a tough one, isn't it? Fuck, I don't know. Sac. Sacajuia. Sac cocaine. Connor, thank you for your Patreon pledge. <laughs> your last name fucking sucks. I can't imagine being a, like the. the um, so what's it called? Are you even here in right school? Now? Okay. When you have a substitute yeah, it's, teacher, it's called school. There you go, substitute teacher. I remember. <laughs> Jesus uh, Christ. Oh uh, yeah. And then right before <laughs> Rob just had that fucking mental breakdown right there. I think I just <laughs> just stroked he, out. He walked out of the recording room and to go pee. And he's like, Beverly's mad because I wore these sweatpants out there. Wore these sweat <laughs> shorts, shorts out <laughs> dinner and I. It's like he just rolled out of a NASCAR race. I mean, it is nice out. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rachel Romero. Thank you, Chris. Kirkland and uh Chris, thank you for your Patreon pledge. And then last but not least is Jeff Sanger. But hearing thank you, Jeff Sanger. I think he's been listening for a really, really long time. But Chris Kirkland, it reminded me the the last name Kirkland. We went to school with a whole pack of Kirklands. They all had buck teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I remember they were all in the band. And the one night one Kirkland, he was playing the tuba and he didn't know how to play the tuba. He could barely lift the goddamn thing up. <laughs> This is at a basketball game, and we were sitting up by the band, and he went somewhere. He left, and he put his tuba down, and one of our other friends said, Kirkwoods. They were the Kirkwoods. Are you sure? Yeah. That was the Kirk- Kirklands. No. I they know pro- you're talking about They now. probably listen. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. And this is probably going to get me arrested. But my friend, he dared me to fart. It's all right. Let's go on told me to fart <laughs> in the big part of the tuba you know the giant yeah, <laughs> yeah. let me fart the tuba <laughs> but i said i'll one up you dude i'm gonna fart in the mouthpiece <laughs> they're gonna poop in it <laughs> so i exposed my bare ass <laughs> no. and i farted into this mouthpiece <laughs> this is, i'm telling you this is horrible stuff dude <laughs> i hate that i'm burying my soul like this and then after I farted in the mouthpiece, he started laughing really hard, which in tagging, I mean, it egged me on, okay? Yeah, yeah. So then I took my gum out, <laughs> and I said, so fucked up. and I said, with any good whiskey, you gotta seal it. And I stuck my gum in the mouthpiece of the tube and sealed my fart in there. <laughs> my winter fresh blue gum. <laughs> so when he came back, he went to go blow this motherfucker. <laughs> Just hit a note and it's like, ah! no, he couldn't, he put his mouth up to it, and I... I, he got past the taste pretty quickly, I guess. It's winter fresh. Probably tasted good. 
But he went to blow with his tuba, and he looked like a chipmunk full of nuts in his mouth. His cheeks just went out because he couldn't pass any wind through it because I shoved my gum in his mouthpiece. <laughs> oh, it's so fucked up. And if you're out there, Kirkland, Kirkwood, whatever the fuck your name is, I want to apologize for that. That was one of the, that's the meanest thing I ever did to anybody. <laughs> Which I guess that's not that bad. <clears throat> it is pretty bad. But you know what? I st- one time that kid was getting picked on by um, we'll call them we'll call them Gangsters Paradise. He was getting okay. picked on by Gangsters Paradise, and uh, I took up for this kid big time. This was after I said I got to take care of this kid. I fucked his tuba. <laughs> you have up. to even it out. <laughs> I farted in his tuba. <laughs> Dropped the log in the big part of his tuba. <laughs> oh man! Speaking of farting and mouthpieces, <laughs> one of my favorite websites to peruse on the Facebook is Barstool Sports. Yeah, they yeah. kind of cover sports in an alternative mm-hmm. outlook, but they post a lot of shit posts as well. Right. And today they posted one that says, "Have you ever had a fart that reached third gear?" <laughs> Is this the video? The TikTok video? I I think yeah, so. Yeah. 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 I saw this yesterday. You too. saw it? Okay. Yeah. It's a couple and the woman's lying face down in the bed playing on her phone and the <laughs> husband just sitting next to her and he rips out, he rips off the gnarliest fart that I've ever fucking yeah. heard. His ass downshifts. Yeah. So let's see if it plays it real quick here. If we can fire this bad boy up. <laughs> That's that is such a good fart. Dude, <laughs> the best part of this. All right, I'll that fart went from zero to sixty. <laughs> it's struggling there. <laughs> it's trying to go up a hill. <laughs> I can't. That's what my car sounded like when I was a teenager. Yeah, but then I watched this video, and then I started reading. I started reading the comments. This guy said he got a little muddy towards the middle, <laughs> <laughs> but he stayed in it. Impressive. He really oh, did. oh man, he's pushing hard. You can tell he's pushing really fucking hard. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> this other guy said I'm surprised that dude didn't take flight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, fuck! It's not like so he good. held a motorcycle under <laughs> the vast pool. Of mud. I can't even read these. This uh, is the dumbest fucking shit. That's ever. that's so good. I don't even fucking care. I'm gonna play it. <laughs> right there, dude. He shitted. <laughs> oh, you know, dude was laying up in the bed with his girlfriend, and uh, he lifted his leg, and dude shitted it. <laughs> She's no like, doubt. what the fuck? <laughs> she looked so pissed. <laughs> yeah, dude, did you fuck? Can you imagine how rancid that room smelled? That dude shit on himself. And there's he's, no- he's, a, he's a girthy guy, too. That sounded like wet cat food. <laughs> wet cat food had a sound. That sounded yeah. like applesauce. Right. <laughs> Jesus Christ. If you fart like that, please record it. Send us to brohiopodcast at gmail.com. We'd, be lo- we'd love to hear oh. if you can produce sounds like that. We would be just elated to hear your story. Man, that's a good it one. It sounds like a Mazda coming off the green light. <laughs> <laughs> These comments, dude, I can't fucking... Oh, man. What's the next one here? That was the best part. Oh, The bubbly part. <laughs> that's when his asshole got a little wet. <laughs> and this guy says, right, like her farts don't sound like you ran over a Costco-sized bottle of Hellman's mayonnaise. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't even want to be here doing this show anymore. Uh, this stuff tears me down. We'll just talk about this fart for another two hours. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Potatoes only belong in one human hole. Man, <laughs> I'm so glad you wrote this article because I was going to bring this up. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Doctors are starting to get very concerned about people who subscribe to a dangerous home remedy touted on numerous websites, which involves... Cert- inserting a potato into your rectum. <laughs> Did that just play on its own? No, I played it. Oh. <laughs> it was like, oh, perfect. <laughs> Credible medical professionals are emphasize- emphasizing that this will not, in fact, help with hemorrhoids. <laughs> Why would that help with hemorrhoids? I don't even want to read the rest of the article. Push them back in your ass? And there's people out there, okay? It's on Etsy or Pinterest yeah, or something. Yeah, they're freezing them. 
Say it for hemorrhoids. <clears throat> what do they call it? It's not hemorrhoids. It's something else. Piles. <laughs> Wasn't he a rapper? Piles. Yeah. Plies. I'm not Gangnam Style. No, that was a different name. Yeah, Sigh. Si that's Sigh. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Sounded like a pile of shit. That's why oh, I was confused. Shit. Piles can be an irritating condition. Sufferers are sometimes too embarrassed to seek professional help turning to old wives' tales. <laughs> I, first off, if your idea of you know fixing this is to freeze a potato and shove it up your ass and not bake it, at least if you bake it, it's a little softer. You gotta soak it in water to get the starch out, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows that. You gotta put some cheese and bacon on it. Your grandpa's like, listen, boy, sit down for a second. I know you're not feeling real good right now, but I know a good way we can fix your butthole. <laughs> Grab one of them goddamn Idaho's or Russets we got in there in the cabinet. Put that motherfucker in the freezer. Right, one of the eyes breaks off the potato. Do you sprout a potato in your ass? <laughs> About 3 a.m. we're going to cram that thing up your fucking poop hole. <laughs> ain't nothing I ain't ever gone through before. <laughs> you can do it if I can do it, boy. I'm tired of you goddamn millennials <laughs> thinking you can just do <laughs> So you can just do whatever the fuck you want. You can't cram a frozen potato up your ass. Like I need a Tide Pod afterwards. You can't help me out in the field. <laughs> I don't even know anymore, dude. Oh, I'm so disappointed in everything we've accomplished. I know. And this, it's, is, this is all it's, all it's come to. We make a fucking mockery of ourselves. Uh huh. Every fucking week we come here. Yeah. I don't know what the fuck. I have no idea what we're doing anymore, but it's okay. I don't even know if people are listening anymore. No, it could just be me and you just sitting here. Brandon Party, he's listening. Uh, we we, we uh, can't even win best podcast in Dayton. <laughs> oh, yeah. Some fucking dude. I'm still stewing about that. Some fucking guy with two down. I told Rob, as soon as that, that competition uh, started, I said, the lady running the competition has her own podcast, and she fucking hates us. Rob's like, we're sure going to fucking win it, dude. We'll blow them out. No one else makes podcasts. There were some really good podcasts in there. Don't yeah, there was. Wrong. One of our best friends, Izzy Rock, does the Gym City podcast. It's extraordinarily incredible to this community. I yeah, do believe that. Yeah, definitely. But then, like, Murder and Such didn't even get nominated, which makes no fucking sense. <laughs> and then the guy, the Fifth and Ludlow guy, that's a good podcast, but no one listens to it. Like, I, people listen to it. It's it. a mini series, and it was two years ago. Five episodes. <clears throat> 14 I I, Facebook followers. <laughs> if you just compare the analytics. Yeah. I'm not trying to disgrace what they've accomplished, what anyone's accomplished in the podcast world, because we are far from the top of the mountain. We're not even halfway. I don't know where we're at on the mountain. All I know... We're probably not even the best one in Vandalia, so but when still. When I walk around with my Ohio podcast shirt on in public, people fucking recognize me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Once at Joanne Fabrics. <laughs> one time, this person let me go on a red light. Do you remember when I got the email about uh, from... Kane's chicken. Oh yeah, the guy was cooking in the back, and he wrote me. He said, "I saw you out there <laughs> with your wife and your daughter." I was like, "Oh, Jesus Christ!" Oh, shit. Should have fucking come out there and said, "Hello." Open that for me, please. What we've learned in this episode so far: don't put frozen butt, <laughs> don't put frozen potatoes in your butthole. Thank you, sir. You have those man fingers. Yeah, My yeah. fingers are too dainty and delicate. Yeah, dude, these things have seen war. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Yeah, thank you, guys. This is probably one of those episodes that might get us killed. Yeah. Fortunately, I believe we're far enough from ground zero on this one that it might not get us hurt. But we've got some friends in Chicago that <clears throat> very well could get murdered for listening to this podcast. If you are from Chicago, you might know all about the atrocities committed by the C Chicago Police Department. And whenever Brandon, <clears throat> he sponsored this episode, he gave us the topic. We went through it. And it looked like it was going to be something different than what it was initially. <clears throat> and what I mean by that, when I first looked at the story, I thought it was a story about 7,000 people that had disappeared. These people did disappear, but kind of in a different way. They didn't like fucking leave the earth, but they were quote unquote disappeared for quite a substantial amount of time. It's brings to light a lot of things for me a lot of injustices, a lot of social and racial injustices that go along with the Chicago Police Department. Now, Rob and I have both been affiliated and worked for law enforcement agencies. I worked directly for a city police department at one point, so I learned all about the, the workings of a small 
small city police. I don't know, mm-hmm. not a small city, but a city nonetheless. I learned the yeah, <clears throat> nothing like Chicago. <clears throat> Excuse me. I learned all about the inner workings of this department and the court systems and how things kind of work. Nowhere in my, I guess, I saw some really fucked up shit happen at the prison. I'm not going to lie about that. I saw guys get beat that didn't need to get beat. I saw guys get hurt that didn't necessarily need to be hurt. I saw a lot of fucked up shit at the prison. Working at the prison was probably... The most miserable experience of my entire life. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> it was completely, uh, it was darkness in my life yep. for the number of years that I worked there. Yeah, and you you did a way bigger stint than what I did. I was just, I was, I love the people, not not the environment. The, the other COs that I worked with, I liked them for the most yeah. part, but it's just, it's just negative and you have to be on guard at all time. It's it's that, and it's not only the the inmates you have to look out for. You have to look out for the people that are working around you. Ninety percent of the people you work with are a fucking snake, and they're oh, yeah. willing to do whatever they have to do <clears throat> to make you look like dog shit. Yep. They're not there to make you. The for me, the ideology is we're going in, guys, and we're going out together. Okay, we're. We're going in in one piece, and we're coming out in one piece. Let's mm-hmm. put our backs together, and let's fucking fight. And I had guys in there that would do that with me, that that did do that with me, where I said, I remember one specific incident where I was in one of the worst cell blocks in the entire institution, working with a dude that was normally in that cell block. <clears throat> and that made it a little bit easier to work with someone that was in a cell block as the regular because he yeah. knows where everybody belongs. He mm-hmm. knows who stays where. He knows who's leaving on a pass, who's leaving on a medical pass, who's leaving. He just knows his shit. He's he, familiar. He knows the guys in the block, whereas I'm a relief officer. I'm just there trying to keep from keeping the motherfucker from burning down. Yeah. And when they call Chow, literally you get a phone call from the Chow Hall and they say, J Block, send him to Chow. And then you put your hands up your mouth. You say, J Block, Chow, 10 minutes. Everybody in the entire cell block has to be out the crash gate of the cell block to go to the chow hall within 10 minutes. <clears throat> Some guys kind of lenient with the 10 minutes. If you run out the door and, you know, it's 10 seconds after the 10 minutes, they'll let you go. This dude slammed the fucking gate at 10 minutes on the dot. And I know there was three dudes walking towards the crash gate that were skull crushing bloods, dude. Bad they motherfuckers. Bad fucking dudes. Yeah. And, uh, and he it was his cell block. He knew these dudes, and they were like, they were just a, an immediate uproar. They're like, "You gotta, you gotta tell us we can't fucking eat." <clears throat> and I was up on the second floor, and I said, "Jesus Christ!" <laughs> and I ran down there, and at this point, they like a lot of bloods. I'd say a dozen, dozen and a half bloods that surrounded us in a circle, and they were kind of like. They were talking with their hands and putting their fists in their hands like, you know, you can't deny us fucking food. We can fucking kill you for some shit like that. <clears throat> Great. They're going to take the block. They're going to take us hostage. They're going to fucking kill us. Right. They're going to fuck me. Statistics <laughs> show um, <clears throat> black fellows have huge dicks, and I've worked in the <clears throat> shakedown room. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is falling apart right now. It's okay. Huge penises. It's going to hurt. <laughs> it's not necessarily going to feel great, but I'm going to take it. I'm going to do my best. <clears throat> and I put my back up against my partner's back. Then I said, I turned my shoulder over to his, and I said, let's fucking do this, dude. Like, let's fucking, let's fight him. Let's <laughs> let's go down swinging. <laughs> and we put our backs against each other, and we put our hands up, and these dudes laid down like scared dogs. Just backed away, went back to their cells, and laid down, didn't make a fucking peep for the rest of the night. These guys were talking about, they could kill us for denying them food. <clears throat> At that point, I was thinking... I'm going to lose my fucking life. At the back of these cell blocks, they have huge red crash gates. They're called safe houses. You can go in there during a riot. Okay. We were 50 yards away from the safe house. We had nowhere to go. There was nowhere to go. Yeah, that's a good little hall. <clears throat> and uh, these guys surrounded us. I put my back up against his, and I said, let's fucking get it on, dude. And he was like, okay, let's do it. And these guys backed down, like scared, like, just like, they I went and laid down like scared dogs, like I said. And at the end of the day, man, uh, it's just intimidation. Count. They, <clears throat> they don't want to catch no charge, no more charges, right? 
we were counting them at the end of the night when they're all locked up. And he said, man, all I can think about was my baby for a second. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, I thought we were going to fucking die. I said, I thought we were going to die too, dude. But you know what? I'm here for you. You're, you're here for me. We're going to get the fuck out of here. And from that second on, that dude, he respected the shit out of me. And you don't get to know everybody. Yeah. Like, super good working at a place like that. A big place, but word got around, like, that dude will put his back up and get you, and he'll fucking fight. Like, <laughs> it was it was about to burn down. Yeah. And I was, I did not want to fucking die. There's nothing in that place that I would die for. There was nothing that I could have proved by saying, let's put our backs together and fight. There, there was nothing to prove. I should have opened the fucking door and said, go to chat. Thinking about it now, thinking about my three beautiful daughters, and thinking about every, everything I have, there was nothing to gain by saying, you can't eat. You you know, I should have just popped the door and said, fucking go eat. What's the, what's right. the matter? But it's all Sure the fuck up next time. <clears throat> yeah. Let it's me give about, you a fucking order. That's, you know, listen to that shit. But. It's all about respect in there. Yep. It's all about when I tell you no, um, fucking no means no. Just but like he, your kids. Yeah, and you got to think half these guys that are in there, gang related, they're not used to, like, getting fucking told what to do. Like, no. 10 minutes or you're not fucking eating. Yeah. They're like, you know what? I'm going to fucking do what I want when do I want. Do what the fuck I want. That dude yeah. went back to his cell. The main dude. The the There was three sh- shot callers. I call the cell them. runner. But the one big dude uh-huh. that was doing the do, he went back to his cell and he ate an entire jar of peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> fucking protein, dog. Yeah, I know. I said, that motherfucker is getting in there getting stronger. <clears throat> He's getting yoked. He's going to fucking kill me. <laughs> when he does get his chance, He's going to splatter my brains all over the tile in yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, but that's. And now, maybe, or maybe not, a quick word from a few of our favorite sponsors. Like I said, Rob and I, have we've had infinite travels in our life that have taken us all kinds of, to the dark reaches of the world, including this podcast where we've learned about a lot of dark things, but we've also walked the walk a little bit, and we know about the social injustices that happen, the law, happen in the criminal justice system. There's a lot of bad shit that happens. But when I'm reading through this story, I'm thinking, God damn, man, they are literally stripping these people of their God-given rights. And I'm not one of these guys, like, you're taking away my goddamn first, second amendment. I don't even know what the fucking first and second amendment are. Like, I know the second <laughs> amendment is guns, the first amendment, you can say whatever the fuck you want. But they're literally taking people's rights away. And it's so nauseating to read about that the, there's such a culture and storied pattern with the Chicago Police Department of them doing Whatever the fuck they want, whenever the fuck they want, to whoever the fuck they want. It's a bad deal. Bad deal all the way around, Rob Dog. Yeah. And I would like to precursor this episode by saying there are a lot of good cops out there. Rob knows a lot of good cops. Yep. I know a lot of good cops. I know cops that I used to work. There's guys that I would still die for right now. And it's not even, I didn't work with these guys directly. I just kind of watched them work. And And I would even go out to say that. 95% 95% of the people who go into the who go into it don't go into it with the intention on being ever becoming a bad cop. Oh, absolutely not. But street talks motherfucker. Yeah. Shit happens. Shit does happen. You see, and that's the thing is if if you're working close to corruption and seeing <sighs> that, you know, it bene- it benefits this guy, why shouldn't I get a cut of that, you know what I mean? Tell me about it. Dude. And people that are have loose morals, it's it's going to happen. Yeah. And even on this show, we talked to one of the greatest cops of all time, Gil Valley. He was going to eat his fucking wife. But you know what? He didn't. He held back and he maintained his position at the New York Police Department. That I'm going to be a good cop. But then they fired his ass because he wrote a book about eating his wife. He had fantasized about eating his wife. And if you've never listened to the Cannibal Cop episode we released, I recommend going back and listening to that one because we directly interviewed the guy that was involved with that that the, we interviewed the cannibal cop so go back and find our cannibal cop episode fantastic interview um, but this episode we're talking about bad cops and the difference in like i said the agencies that we've worked for, i worked for a small city okay mm-hmm. but even we're talking about the chicago police department which is around fourteen thousand employees <laughs> yeah fourteen thousand employees a lot Dayton, where we live at, has 350 sworn officers. Mm-hmm. Dayton is a big city and, to yeah, me. Yeah, it's a it's a big city. It's yeah. not a I mean, it's not huge. I've been to 
Phoenix and shit. I go there a lot, but yeah, it's not like Cincinnati or Columbus, but I mean, it's three hundred and fifty cops. Which, <coughs> and even even thinking about our area, three hundred and fifty cops doesn't seem like enough. No, it doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Especially when you got guys like us living around. Here. <laughs> exactly. I don't know how long this Arnold Palmer has been sitting in my basement. Fuck it, man. Really rip. My throat is. Worst that's gonna happen is gonna come out of your dick. Yeah. So it's in okay. The meantime, you're. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking drifting. <laughs> drifting. <laughs> you know that motherfucker had a cheesesteak for dinner, oh, too. Dude, he had I... something nasty. Yeah. So I just needed a drink right there. That's all right. What that whistle, daddy? 14,000 employees of the Chicago Police Department. New York City, 55,000 law enforcement employees. That is insane. <laughs> 55,000 just yeah. in the police department alone. So to say that every cop in this agency is a good cop. Right. Or that you would be lying to say and, something. And I would like definitely that. say that in my opinion I would say that these larger cities with this larger employee count there's going to be some sort of corruption. Dude, a place like that, it's inevitable. So, especially when you're constantly working in the slums and it you got to be slummy in order to get through. That's what I'm saying. You and I have had these experiences and I feel like Working sec- when I worked private security, mm-hmm. that taught me more about the streets than I've learned through the police department and the prison. I learned so much about the streets working private security. Oh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, these streets we're talking about here, Chicago. <laughs> these are different fucking streets. These right. are different, different streets. Oh yeah, yeah. There, we don't have. We have gangs in Dayton. We don't have Chicago sh- streets in Dayton. There is crime <laughs> syndicate. There are major crime families. Right. Major gang activity. And to say that gang activity isn't happening around us right now, it would be exceptionally naive. That shit is yeah. happening. But in these cities right here, Los Angeles, you know, Chicago, New York City, places like that, there is some major fucking crime. Right. Major crime gangs. Major crime atrocities going on. It pales in the comparison to the shit that's going on here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Fucking 12 people in a minute get murdered. I don't know what the statistic is, but every day in Chicago, people are getting murdered. You know, we don't have a murder every day in Dayton. We have a lot in Dayton, in the city of Dayton. We, mm-hmm. we, we don't fucking, we don't live in the city of Dayton. No. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> uh, but in Chicago, New York, there's people people and people and people and people getting murdered every single day it's a different it's a different street so while we are talking about some suspicious claims and occurrences from recent years the chicago police department does have a story to be told in reference to their corruption over the past several decades that's starting with uh william hanhart i'm gonna let rob read that because my voice is gonna poop out yeah take a break sip sip on your palmer there okay (laughs) so in 2001 deputy superintendent william hanhart pleaded guilty to running a nationwide jewel theft ring that over 20 years may have that over 20 years may have stolen five million dollars worth of diamonds and other gems he had served with the department for 33 years and was sentenced to 12 years in federal custody jesus man and um the reason I, I'm kind of giving all of these small snippets that leads up to what we're talking about, which is Holman Square, a facility, we'll call it. It's a lot of different yeah. things. A detention center. Yeah. But I give all of these stories of instances of corruption leading up to what we get to, which is Holman Square. Because, like I said earlier, Chicago Police Department has a story to be told about their constant abuse of power and constant corruption. That's why I'm kind of throwing in these little stories that don't, that don't necessarily pertain to Holman Square, which is the main focus of this episode. I'll let you get that. Sure. Next, we got Eddie C. Hicks. So this is in December 2001. Sergeant Eddie C. Hicks was indicted for operating a gang with other CPD officers. The group would raid drug houses, taking the contraband for resale. Damn. Hicks skipped a court appearance on June 9th, 2003, and was placed on the FBI's most wanted list. 
The Hicks was arrested in Detroit on September 12th, 2017, nearly 15 years after he had fled on the eve of trial on federal drug conspiracy charges. So Hicks, 68, had been play, or had been the subject of an intern, or international manhunt since 2003, according to the FBI. And then we got Ronald Watts' corruption ring. This is former police sergeant Ronald Watts was accused of being at the center of a corruption ring that was allegedly responsible for planning evidence and framing innocent black Chicagoans in the early 2000s. And this scares the shit out of me. Cops that plant evidence. Terrifying. That, that is the most helpless, fleeting feeling I could imagine that a person could ever feel. Yes. Is the, the, the practice of an officer planting evidence to... Uh, Make it look like you did something that you didn't fucking do. Yeah, keep them cameras rolling. Yeah. Yep. Um, now, officers working under Watts were instrumental in destroying the lives of citizens. According to WGN-TV, Watts and subordinates also took bribes and stole drugs from dealers in addition to planning evidence. Many of the people they targeted were residents of the Ida B. Wells housing project, as well as other low-income neighborhoods. Some of those who were arrested and convicted for falsifying evidence have been exonerated in sporadic bursts. There have been four mass exonerations related to Watts in less than a year, <laughs> according to NBC <laughs> Chicago Five reports. That is insane. That's good. That's a good track record. That is insane. Now, the city of Chicago is being sued for or by federal court by 19 people who say that they were framed by corrupt CPD sergeant Ronald Watts. Oh, yeah. And I'll get this next one because I kind of left out some stuff that I was going to free, uh, just ad lib here. John Burge, uh, he was an American police detective and commander in the Chicago Police Department who was accused of torturing more than 200 criminal suspects between 1972 and 1991 in order to force confessions. That's right, using torture to force confessions. According to The Guardian, who actually wrote, they kind of blew the lid off all this um Holman Square stuff. According to The Guardian, between 1972 and 1991, Burge either, quote, either directly participated in or implicitly appro approved the torture of at least 118 individuals in police custody. Federal prosecutors stated that Burge's use of torture began in 1972. Burge was the leader of a group of police officers known variously as the Midnight Crew, Burge's Ass Kickers, or the A-Team who abused suspects to co coerce confessions. Federal prosecutors stated that the Midnight Crew used methods of torture, including beating, suffocation, Ugh. burning, and electrical shock to the genitals. Fuck. I'm fixing to light your pussy up. <laughs> I don't think they did this to women. I think it was mostly isolated to men. Joke's on you. I like that shit. Go shock my dick. <laughs> shock your balls and you just come. <laughs> You're going to be shocked when you see how small my dick is. <laughs> You won't shock this dick. Good luck getting this dick up outside my body. <laughs> oh man, I can imagine turn into a vagina in a uh, quickness. Yeah, uh, Lieutenant, we went in there to shock his dick. We couldn't fucking find it. It's got a big old poof of hair. There's nothing. There's nothing down there. Get, get Carl Winslow on the phone. <laughs> you, you know what it looks like when a turtle sticks his head back in a shell. Like, That's what his dick looks like. This is the saddest part of the episode for me is Carl Winslow. He was a true soldier of the oh, Chicago man. Police Department. And this is not yeah. a direct reflection of him as a father <laughs> or as a police not sergeant. At all. Even though he should have fucking killed Urkel when he had the chance. <laughs> R.I.P. The most prominent events related to his abuses occurred in winter 1982. In February of 82, there were several shootings of law enforcement officers on Chicago's south side. Two Cook County Sheriff's officers were wounded, and a rookie Chicago police officer was shot and killed. Oh on a CTA bus on February 5th. On February 9th, just four days later, a person on the street grabbed a police officer's weapon and shot and killed both the officer and his partner. Oh, man. The last incident occurred within Burgess, Burgess' jurisdiction. He was lieutenant and commanding officer of Area 2. Burge was eager to catch those responsible, um, as he should have been, yeah. and launched a wide effort to pick up suspects and arrest them. Initial interrogation pr procedures allegedly inc including shooting pets of suspects, handcuffing subjects to stationary objects for entire days, and holding guns to the heads of minors. Jesse Jackson, the reverend, or, you know, uh, Jesse Jackson, we all know. Yeah. Um, he was in charge of Operation Push, the Chicago Defender, and black Chicago police officers um, 
were all outraged by Renault Robinson, president of Chicago's Afro-American Police League, characterized the dragnet operation as sloppy police work, a matter of racism. Jackson complained that the black community was being held under martial law. The police captured suspects for the killings on February 9th through identification by other suspects. Tyrone Sims identified Donald Kojak White as the shooter, and Kojak was linked to, to Andrew and Jackie Wilson by having committed a burglary with them earlier on the day of the killings. And I want you to remember the name Jackie Wilson. Kojak is such a gangster nickname. It is. Kojak. Kojak. Or Andrew Wilson. Andrew Wilson and Jackie Wilson were the suspects. Andrew Wilson was arrested on the morning of February 14th, 1982, for the murder of the last two police officers. By the end of the day... He was taken by police and admitted to Mercy Hospital and Medical Center with lacerations on various parts of his head, including his face, chest bruises, and second-degree thigh burns. Oof. More than a dozen of the injuries were documented as caused while Wilson was in police custody. Both Andrew Wilson and his brother Jackie confessed to involvement in the February 9th fatal shootings of the police officers. A medical officer who saw Andrew Wilson sent a memo to Richard M. Daly... The, who was then the county, uh, the county state's attorney, asking for his case to be investigated on suspicion of police brutality. Burge was eventually sentenced to four years in prison for the crimes that he had committed over the the time of his career. Four years, but even yeah, and it was it was very sketchy. It was a lot of back and forth. He eventually did get fired, but if these guys, I'm one of those guys that thinks. If you commit a certain crime, kill a police officer for no reason, touch a child, um, kill an innocent woman, kill an innocent man, I think it's an eye for an eye, in my opinion. Kill the motherfucker. This guy, but I also believe in the due process of law. If the gas station at the end of my street gets robbed tonight, they say it was a fucking fat guy in a red shirt. And they come knock on my door tomorrow, and they say, we're looking for a fat guy in a red shirt. And I look down, there's a 99% chance that I'm going to be wearing a red shirt, and there's a 104% chance that I'm going to be fucking fat. I'm going to be a fucking fat guy. So they're going to be like, oh, you're going to hop in the car with us. And then I get to the police station, and they proceed to get my dick to come out, and they shock it, and they beat the fuck out of me, even though I was sitting here with you. That's not me getting the due process of law. <laughs> Very true. There's certain rights I'm guaranteed. I'm allowed to be fat. <laughs> You're allowed to wear a red shirt. I'm allowed to wear a red shirt. That doesn't mean that I was the gas station robber. <laughs> Have I gone down to that gas station before and forgot my wallet? And the lady in sa- the side, she says, I'll get you in the morning. Because she knows I'm going to be stopping by on my way to work mm. to get some gas. She knows I'm going to be getting a cinnamon bun and a fucking <laughs> chocolate, whatever. A you who But it wasn't a robbery, okay? She said, take it. I'll get you in the morning when you come through. All right, baby girl, you know what I'm saying. You know, you know I'm good for it, girl. You know all dad good for the three ninety nine. I come up in this motherfucker. <laughs> then you just cash. never go back to that gas station again. <laughs> Gotta fill my lawnmower up and then walk outside and I just run. <laughs> Leave it there. Oh man. But even with all these dark shadows hanging over this Chicago police department, you'd think these guys would pump the fucking brakes a little bit. Which they did not. They have not pumped the brakes even remotely at all. The Department of Justice has said several times there is a cowboy culture at the Chicago Police Department. And when I mean a cowboy cult- culture, that means these guys think they can do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. There was a supervisor I worked with. He was, do his, do, he was doing his rounds. And he come down to me and he said, hey, that guy up in cell three on the second range, has he been talking a lot of trash today? And I said, he hasn't bothered me at all. And he said, I'm about to whip his fucking ass. And I said, go for it. You know, I don't, <laughs> have at it, buddy. Yeah, have at it. This guy took his fucking duty belt off with his nightstick and his pepper spray and his man down alarm. He handed it to me. He walked up in that cell and shut the fucking door and proceeded to beat the shit out of this guy. Holy fuck. Just, I didn't get to see that. I don't know. I know the dude had a black eye and a bloody nose after, mm-hmm. but I didn't get to see the fight. And the supervisor walked back out. <clears throat> And um, he come down to the desk. He's like, listen, man, you should never do anything like that. I'm an old John Wayne motherfucker. I'm a cowboy. And at that moment, I knew what it meant to be a cowboy 
to or to be a John Wayne motherfucker. And then every time I would get a new person that would start with me, I would tell him like, "You can't just be running around here being a cowboy." Because I thought it sounded really fucking cool. It definitely does. And you can't do it in my cell block because <laughs> cowboys' butts drive me nuts. <laughs> That's no. why you don't talk shit to cowboys. I fuck the shit out of you. Yeah. I'll fuck the shit out of you and fuck you up in your cell. You think some of these queer inmates will fuck you? <laughs> The only time I ever seen anything crazy like that happen was when a, another CEO got piss thrown on him. <laughs> yeah, all oh, yeah. That inmate had a bad night that oh, night. All <laughs> bets are off at that point, buddy. Yeah. That's okay. That guy probably fucking deserved that trophy. Yes, he did. <laughs> so, all of this darkness takes us to Holman Square, which um, the reports I researched that I went through, mostly from theguardian.com, they claim this is a multifunctional center but no one actually knows exactly if it is there, if it isn't. It is there. Sounds like a place you go to shop for interior design things. I don't know. Holman Square. Home. It's, it's Holman. Holman. Ho, yeah. Holman. Holman. The facility is an old, rundown warehouse that is also used as the Chicago Police Department's narco, vice, and, and intel units. It's also a I'm going to say this loosely. It's a jail, but it's not a jail. There's no jail cells. But officially, it is a police detention facility. The thing is, when you go to the county jail, and Rob worked in the county jail, mm-hmm. I did not. Once you came to where I was at, your shit was done. You were yeah, locked you're, up. Yeah, you're fucked. <laughs> you're, you're already deemed guilty where... <laughs> where Rob was at, you worked at the county jail. You did a processing. Yeah. That's the very first thing you do yep. Whenever you enter, before the you t- await your trial, before anything, you yep. go through jail processing. Right? Yep, take your mug shot, take your fingerprints, go into housing, check you out for scars, marks, tattoos, all that fucking shit. Right. Yep. At the Holman Square detention facility, there was no processing. There was nothing like that, which is a bit suspicious yep. to begin with. Very weird. Um, and to say that Holman Square is located in a bad part of town would be a complete understatement. When you speak, of just there's like a blanket, a veil over Chicago that says, that's a bad fucking town. I've been to Chicago. It's not all bad. There's some really nice spots. Yeah, it's like I any place. Took my daughter out on the pier and we, you know, checked out that area of Chicago. It was really, it was a nice area over there. I didn't at any point feel like my life was in danger. But then I've seen guys, when I watch Hood videos on Facebook Live, like, what's up, Saturday night, Chicago, uh, you know what we do? Listen, listen, bro. And the dude just gets quiet, and just in the background you hear, <laughs> it sounds like Baghdad. <laughs> it sounds it sounds horrible. Just, yeah. You know, we'll move to Dayton, buddy. It's not that bad here. We got Domino's Pizza and all kinds of shit, nice stuff like that. Chicago's the place with the bean, right? The bean? Yeah. What do you mean the bean? The big ass silver bean? I think yes. I think yeah. I think it is. I okay. think it is. Yeah. I drove past it. I didn't know did what the fuck it was. It? No, I did not. I, I didn't get to flick the bean. I was busy flicking my own bean at that point. <laughs> and we all understand that bad shit happens. Crime happens. Criminals happen. I, when none of that is ever going to stop, as long as we are a human race. Oh yeah. None of that shit is going to stop. Never. But part of being a criminal and part of our justice system, you have a slight say in your destiny. You didn't do something and you're charged with something you didn't do. There's a process that plays out that allows you to say, here is the evidence that shows that I didn't do what I'm being accused of. That's the beauty of the American law enforcement or the American criminal justice system. The way it should work. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But that's not the way things are operating at Holman Square. So when you first go in, before you're even, before you're even sent to processing, when you're arrested on the street, they're going to give you your Miranda rights, which yep. um, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you can and say will be held against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. Do you understand your rights that I have just read you with these rights in mind? Do you wish to speak to me? That is what a cop has to ask you before he starts interrogating you about the crimes that you've committed. Very true. If a cop ever says to you, and I'm pro law enforcement, I'm pro, but I'm not pro getting, I'm not pro speeding tickets. I think speeding tickets are fucking bullshit. I hate when money grab. I hate when, right. I hate money grabs. I hate when cops are petty 
over shit that doesn't fucking matter. Mm-hmm. I hate when a person gets arrested for having a a joint in their ashtray in their car. Right, right. Stuff like that, it eats me to my core, man. It pisses me off, and it makes me think, like, what the fuck is going on in that cop's life? I understand you to protect and serve, and part of that protecting and serving is, if you want good cops, then these cops have to give you a ticket for a speeding ticket. They have to give you a ticket for having that little joint in your ashtray. Because that's part of being a good cop is doing things by the book and doing things the right way. There's a human element that has to come into play where you can say, you know what? I work with cops that dump stuff out on the ground and stepped on it and say, get the fuck out of the city and don't come back. And the guy would, you know, a little roach or something that the cop would find with some weed in it. He'd throw it and step on it and be like, get the fuck out of here. Don't ever come back. And the guys would leave and that was that was justice. The one, if you listen a few episodes ago, there was the cop I talked about, PJ. that threw the fucking turd out the window that landed on the skylight. <laughs> he was a, a detective for most of the time I worked with him. But at one point, he was super old school, dude. He was a, a street cop when I first started there. And I rode with him like my first or second week or something. He rolls up behind a car, types in the license plate. He's like, this guy's got a suspended license. He looks at the uh, driver's license picture. He says, yep, that's him. All right. I'm like, all right, we're going to fucking do a traffic stop. <laughs> he pulls up next to this guy, bzz, rolls his window down, and he goes, hey, buddy. <laughs> the dude rolls his window down. He says, your fucking license is suspended. I'd get that straightened out. <laughs> <laughs> and the dude just like puts up two fingers like, word, dude, peace. <laughs> Thank you. And the, uh, the cop I work with bzz, rolled the window back up. He's like, I don't like to write tickets. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, but that guy made a lot of really good felony arrests, a lot of good mm-hmm. investigations. He cracked a lot of shit that other people couldn't crack. So I commend him on that. But you got to pick and choose your battles. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm glad I got to see different styles from different people. And I'm glad I got <laughs> I'm glad I got to meet him because that guy had a lot of cool shit to tell and a lot of. <laughs> Most importantly, I'm glad I got the turd story. Yeah. Of all the stuff I got from That's him. amazing. Oh, so That's one of those ones you got to keep for the rest of your life. It undoubtedly is. Yeah. So they have to read you your Miranda rights. They can't take that. They can't take those. I think in the instance of terrorism, you kind of lose some rights. If yeah, you're suspected definitely. of terrorism, I think that you don't have the due process of law. I think that's correct. You don't have the same due process of law. If you were charged with some type, some types of acts of terrorism, okay. I think that's correct. But the guys at this place at Holman Square didn't abide by this process. There's a book in process and there's some computer automation that goes into this. So whenever you go to the county jail, they take your mugshot, take all your shit and they enter it in. So then any of your family members, any attorney can hop on. We live in Montgomery County. They can go to Montgomery County Persons in Custody, and they can look up Nick and Rob. They can type our names in. If we're incarcerated, our picture pops up with uh, our bond, where we were picked up, by what agency, what it would take to get us out, what we're being charged with, all the different shit. This stuff is public record, and it's, it, it is vital to the law and the, to the criminal justice system. So an attorney can use this information to better represent you. And it's part of, <coughs> I'm sorry. And it helps with finding people in some instances. And I've, this place I work at now, we've checked lockups and found employees that weren't answering their phones that weren't <laughs> <laughs> like, I really need this fucking guy to be here today. <laughs> and I'm the one like, Check the jail records, and they look, and the motherfuckers in there for DUI, standing there all crooked with a broken nose and shit. I'm like, yeah, see, I fucking told you, man. <laughs> fucking told you. And but the book, the book in process. There's the computer automation where all the stuff goes into the computer. At Holman Square, they said that they don't do things computerized. That everything is pen and paper. No, <laughs> nothing okay. goes into a computer, aka strictly off the record. Strictly off the record. And also, there's no book in process. There's yeah. no, there's nothing. Just they just go there, and then you're essentially illegally well, detained, pretty much. Yeah, for, I, I, we'll get there. Yeah. But between 2005 and mid 2015, there were 275 arrests in that were entered into the arrest e movement records within the Chicago Police Department. 
the two for in ten years, two hundred and seventy five arrests that were entered into that program. Okay. It's like twenty seven people per year. Yeah. That's, that's not a lot. It's not a especially lot. for that area. Yeah. But those 270 records only make up 4% of the arrests that were brought through Holman Square. 7,351 people were actually arrested and brought through the Holman Square facility. Ooh, man. Ooh, over 7,000 people <laughs> were arrested and brought there for part of the investigation. And only 275 of those people were entered into the computer. And what that wow. means? What that means is, out of those seven thousand three hundred and fifty-one people, only two hundred and seventy-five people were physically accounted for, where their loved ones or their attorney could look up or call the jail and say, "Where is my Where is my client? Or where is my husband?" Yeah, that's like seven thousand twenty-five people, roughly, yeah. that are unaccounted for. Con- the 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 Guardian co- calls it disappeared. These people disappeared. Yeah. They're not physically gone forever, but when they were in, when they passed through Holman Square, they were gone from the earth during that time that they were there. They couldn't. <sighs> there was no way to to verify where they were at. Exactly. <clears throat> Internal police records show that of those more than seven thousand people arrested, only sixty eight of those were allowed access to their attorney, Ooh. or a public notice of their whereabouts was produced. Yeah, that's not good. That portion of the process of your arrest is, in fact, the most vulnerable you will ever be. They, whenever you're first arrested and you're first brought into the police station, you're set down to be, you've hit somebody with your car and you killed them. And you're, you, they set you down. They're going to interrogate you. They're going to ask you if you've been drinking, where all were you going tonight? <clears throat> Any investigation. You bought a little bit of pot and they pick you up. They take you back. They're going to interrogate you. They're going to set you down. They're going to ask you a bunch of fucking questions, but they have to ask you. They have to read you your Miranda rights. Mm -hmm. They have to tell you that, yes, you can have an attorney present. This is the most vulnerable time during the entire investigation for you as a, you know, a criminal or a suspect, I should say. As a person. As a suspect. They're going to say this. They're going to say, I want to help you out. A fucking cop. I love I love the cops that I know. <laughs> but anytime you hear a detective or a cop say, you got to let me help you out, don't ever listen, heed that advice because they want to help nail you to the wall for the crime that you committed. Their job is to make money, and they're not going to make money by letting you walk out that door. No. So don't <laughs> ever believe it. If you're broken down the side of the road and you need to get on the fucking road and the cop rolls up and says, let me help you. Let him push you off the road, but if you bought a dime bag and you sat down and the detective walks in with his file in his arm, he says, let me help you out for a second. He said, like, give me my fucking attorney. Yeah, they're playing good cop just to get you to admit to what you did. <laughs> and as soon as you say, give me my attorney, they can't talk to you anymore. It's done. It's dead. They'll try to. <laughs> uh, they're Legally, they're not allowed to. They're yeah. not supposed to. They're but, not supposed to, but they'll still. Yeah. At Holman Square... They were very persistent after some of these people requested access to their attorneys. Um, the facility itself is nothing short of scary and odd. It is an old, rundown warehouse surrounded by razor wire, floodlights, cameras, and there's no definitive way to enter Holman Square. Many attorneys interviewed say it reminds them of a CIA black site. Which led me down the path of CIA black sites. I didn't know these things existed. But apparently there's sites all over the the world Mm -hmm. where CIAs, the CIA, interrogates terrorists, essentially. And they do all kinds of fucking shit to these guys, whether it's waterboarding or shocking people's nuts. (laughs) Like, this, you know, (laughs) that's where they learn these tactics. Um, You know what, and... Those guys from fucking... I can't, I can't say that I looked down on that in the act of terrorism. Nah, do what nah. you can, Do what you gotta do. Not at all. But the fact that we're comparing a detention facility in America... Yeah, right, 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 right. ...meant for some of the people that were arrested and brought through there were brought through for theft. For petty shit. Yeah, yeah petty theft for zoning violations, whether it's fence violations. There was some pretty 
chintzy shit that was brought yeah, that's through there. That's some fuck shit for sure. The fact that they're comparing this home to, and square to, to the CIA, CIA black, black sites. sites. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely pretty profound. Yeah, that's that's not two and two there. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Far off. Yeah, it's about four and twelve or something <laughs> like that. And it, when it, I just these CIA black sites, these um these guys from Afghanistan, you gotta pull their pants down to shock their dicks. You know that thing fucking stinks. <laughs> you know there's <laughs> some some schmegma on that. It smells awful lot like goat ass. <laughs> goat ass. <laughs> See what I did there. Why does your dick smell like you've been fucking a goat? <laughs> I don't even know. I don't, I don't even know what accent to use. Is that I mean, racist? Yeah, I don't. They're know. terrorists. Who fucking cares? Yeah, not all of them, but the yeah. ones I'm talking about are. It is. They're Listen, awesome. in this scenario, I am not being racist. <laughs> I'm specifically, yeah, talking about terrorists. It's fine. You're fine. Right? We know what you. We know what you really feel. <sighs> that makes me feel so much better. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and many attorneys that were interviewed by the by the Guardian say that okay, I already read that. That it reminds them of a CIA black site. Eighty two point two percent of people detained at Holman Square were black or African American, compared with the population of Chicago, which is only thirty two point nine percent black or African American. Wow. <laughs> Black. Staggering. So pretty much, they're only detaining blacks, black people, yeah. right? Well, not not only eleven point eight of the detainees in the Holman Square logs were okay. Hispanic, compared with twenty eight point nine percent of the population. Five point five percent of the detainees were white, compared with thirty one point seven percent of the population. Of the sixty eight people who Chicago police claim had access to counsel. So they arrested so they arrested over 7,000 people and the Chicago Police Department themselves come, out, come came out with their record and said that only 68 people had access to counsel at Home and Square. That's crazy. 45% were black and 25% were Hispanic and another 26 were white. So this is roughly, you know, let's see here, 26% were white. Judging off of that, the first two numbers, that's like 96% or ninety four percent doesn't matter, dude. Minority. It's, yeah, it's that's crazy. It's fucking trash, man. Yeah, and you, it, like we said in the beginning of the episode, you're dealing with a really bad area here in Holman mm-hmm. Square, a really nasty area. So right, you are gonna get some some bad. In the words of a uh, was it Trump? He said it. Some bad hombres. <laughs> bad hombres. <laughs> Uh, motherfuckers eating KFC on Air Force One has the audacity to say <laughs> bad hombre. Right. Have you seen the commercial for the donut chicken sandwich from KFC? No. Oh, Jesus Christ. Man, I don't take, have cable. They take a gla- <laughs> they take a glazed donut and put a chicken breast on it and then put another glazed donut on top of that and they, it's a sandwich. It's a chicken sandwich between two glazed donuts. Dude, that sounds fantastic. I'm not even going to lie. <laughs> it sounds like it would hurt. It's okay. I can hear my arteries just going... Like a petrified forest. Just... I'm gonna take one for the team. Yeah, dude. We what got... kind of donuts are? Well, who's making these? Are they making these donuts? They look like Krispy Kreme donuts, uh, but I don't think they are. They just look like a basic glazed donut. Yeah, they're probably Krispy Kreme donuts, and they're probably like three days old. Yeah, I don't know. Fuck it, fuck it, dude. I don't care. It's gonna give me the shits regardless of when right. it was made. So, <laughs> so I think what they do is they use this place as leverage. Okay. The officers themselves, they use Holman Square as leverage for the people that they detain. Like, you want to go to Holman? Yeah. They kind of say, when they get them, they're like, you know you're at the fucking rock, dude. You're here. You ain't going nowhere. You might as well tell us what you, that we want to hear. Tell us what we need yeah. to know. Especially when you're threatened with a place like that where you, you essentially disappear off the face of the earth. Well, like you said, it's a narco outpost and it's a vice outpost for all the undercover uh, the undercovers that do that type thing. Right. So there is a lot of people going in there specifically to get these guys to flip. Yeah. Flip and flop right. 
to narc out other to narc on other people. Like that's, if people are going to be wondering where you're at, but they're not going to be able to fucking find you. Exactly. So what are you going to do? And I, that kind of makes sense to me if they do have kind of a site where no, there's no record of you being there. But if they're taking their taking you there specifically to make you flip, that's kind of taking your own safety into consideration. That okay, if you are going to flip on the fucking Chicago gangster disciples. They're gonna fucking kill you. Yeah, and, yeah. And I mean, and that's and that's one thing, you know. Taking taking someone there who's yeah, taking Takeshi there, <laughs> <laughs> Takeshi, as opposed to taking fucking you know someone with a zoning violation. Yeah, which that's why I'm not. If I would have read all that, if I just would have read, you know, they take the hardest, baddest drug vice, whatever. They take the baddest fucking dudes here. If the means justified the end, you know yeah. what I mean. I would be like, okay, there's no no story here. But people are getting incarcerated there for zoning violations, for yeah. having their dogs out, and just all kinds of shit, dude. And, I, and I'm not even saying, you know, if, if that were the case, that it would still be okay, but I could see more so where they're coming from at that yeah. point. But uh, I digress here. Yes. This is a sworn deposition from a senior officer that did work for the Chicago Police Department. The question is, finally, number 18, the documentation of records made available contempor- contemporaneously That's a word. T- to the public for individuals taken to Holman Square. So Joe's is a, you know, a, I guess a undefined, Eat it, Joe's. an undefined name for a person. Mm-hmm. So Joe's at Holman Square, how can you find out as a member of the public? The senior officer's answer during the deposition, he says, I don't know that you can. So he right there says, if they're taken right. there, you can't find them. Yeah, so how can I find out that Nick, if Nick is in there and you not, can't. You, you can't. And the next question, if Joe had been taken to a district, would you be able to find that out as a member of the public? And he says, I don't believe so. Which is completely false. Yeah. One quick Google search of mine. I did a, a Chicago city, of Chicago persons in custody. It's all, all that's public information. It is. And not only is the, the records access for the city of Chicago. So most what I'm used to seeing when I look for a person that's incarcerated is a live is a live update. The Chicago police department there, um, the jail there going back. You can go back and see. You People can go, that, that you can go aren't back even, a ways. You, that yeah. aren't even incarcerated anymore. Yeah, you can go back a ways. I know, and specifically with where we live, we had a friend who got arrested a while back because we, <laughs> all of our all of our group was having a big like cookout or barbecue, and I think he went to he went to Walmart and stole a pack of ground meat and sto- shoved it in his pants and got caught. <laughs> What dumb shit. And we, everybody, a couple guys actually downloaded his mug shot and put it on t-shirts oh, of shit. him. And they called him, they, they they photoshopped his face over the Hamburglar's face because he was stealing hamburger <laughs> meat dickhead. and then sold it. Jesus. So I mean, you can, you can see these things yeah. pretty, pretty, pretty quickly. Just by going to public search one dot Chicago police dot org slash arrests. And I type in Jesse. What is his name? Smollett? Smollett. Smollett. Juicy Smoothie. There he is right there. there. He He's not currently incarcerated. No, but you can still see his mugshot. You can still see his personal information. It's all there. Yeah, it's there. And he... (laughs) What a fucked up story that is. Yeah. (laughs) He was the one that pretty much faked the hate crime, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah, that's what I thought. He said... I remember Dave Chappelle talking about him. He said, hey, I need you Jamaican fellows to come over here. We're going to dress you up like the KKK. I want you guys to beat the shit out of me. Here's 20 bucks. <laughs> no, there was a check involved. I don't know much about this case. I just I don't know either. there was some really funky <clears throat> shit going on. Uh, but this guy did a lot of stuff that uh, try to make it look like a hate crime when actually he paid people to commit a hate crime against him. In court, the Chicago Police Department argues for the need of the veil of secrecy, which, like I said, we kind of understand. They try to turn people into confidential informants, and you can't do that at a district facility because you have a lot of wandering eyes and a lot of people that you don't want to know that you are possibly becoming a confidential informant for the CPD. That that puts you in jeopardy inside housing, so. (laughs) It does. Big time. Hey, you know, you told on Big big Daryl down the street there. Well, I'm fixing to fuck the shit out you. 
<laughs> I'm fixing to turn your butt pussy into a goddamn. I'm gonna turn it into a roast beef sandwich. I'm gonna eat your butthole. My boy Nicolicious on Bro Ohio, he don't be eating no fucking butthole. But I'm gonna eat your butthole. <laughs> I'm gonna eat your butt all so fucking good. You ain't gonna... oh, <laughs> I'm gonna eat that butthole. <laughs> the big old stanky butthole. I can't get over the look at her face whenever she's watching that. She's flabbergasted. Fury. <laughs> yeah. Just projectile out of his ass. <laughs> she's like, oh no, you didn't. <laughs> oh shit. We gonna need to change these goddamn sheets. <laughs> According to the Chicago police records, at least 14 men in custody at the facility have been punched, struck with nightsticks, slapped, tasered, or subjected to other forms of physical violence at Holman Square. And I will, go, I will go to say 14 is probably a very low number. Oh, there's no doubt about it, <laughs> I would say, I would say out of the 7,000 people that have been locked up, I would say probably at least 6,000 of them. Have been fucking beat. Have been beat, yeah. yeah. At least... Two people taken here died while in custody, and one of the uh, one of the ones I read about was indeed labeled a drug overdose. That's what I was going to say. I would like to see what their cause of death would have been. Oh, yeah. Bunch of fucking bullshit. That's some fuck shit. Yeah. Lieutenant William Kilroy, a senior narcotics officer at the Holman Square-based Bureau of Organized Crime, said, quote, very frequently... Someone arrested at Holman Square will not be subsequently charged with a crime because they are converted into a cooperating individual. So mm. what he's saying, these guys are getting arrested for shit, but when they come here, we're getting them to do shit for us, and when they leave here, they're no longer charged with a crime. And that's directly from the lieutenant mm. over the, uh, the the Bureau of Organized Crime. Holman Square-based police who fall under the umbrella of the Bureau of Organized Crime do, quote, not do electronic case reporting. And this is according to that Lieutenant William Kilroy. Everybody outside the Bureau does electronic case reporting. We do hard copy paper case reporting. Which is so they're still stuck in the Stone fucking Age. Fucking bullshit. It's yeah. one Easy de- to hide. It's one department. It's It's not, you know... We're going to do our reports on a computer, which every police department in America has been doing for the, at least the past 15 years. Yeah. These guys dealing with crime bosses in major gangs are doing all of the reporting right. via paper and pencil. And especially in a ma- like you just said, like a major city like this. Exactly. It'd be different if you were like, <laughs> if they were talking about the police department in like the city where the fucking hills have eyes took place at. Yeah. You know what I mean? Computer, hey, we uh, don't worship the goddamn <laughs> devil here. Well, there's like three fucking cops in the entire city. You fucking weirdos. Right. You got a goddamn tail light out. <laughs> 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 Chicago attorneys are often turned away from this facility when they try and gain access. These same attorneys interviewed claim that if you are operating under the assumption that your client is at this facility, Holman Square, you just kind of sit back and fucking wait for all the shit to unfold because there's nothing that you can you can do. You wait for them to snitch. Yeah. Attempts to find a phone number come up fruitless. Police confirm that there is no access to pay phones for the arrestees at the facility in like we were just talking about the legalities of that whenever you're arrested you're allowed to make a to make a concentrated effort to uh try and make a phone call to an attorney or make a phone right. call to whoever you need to let know like hey I'm in the, I'm locked up yeah it's I, the problem here with me this is a very low income area, a crime ridden area, a, ba- a very bad area, okay? Mm-hmm. This is kind of a loophole that a lot of people don't realize. When you're arrested, you can say, All right, I want my attorney. There you gotta say, All right, the guy, he's not talking. We gotta give him his attorney. But if you're a low income person, attorneys, the cheapest attorneys, cost a lot of goddamn money. Mm-hmm. A lot of money. So someone gets arrested, you already are living off kibbles and bits, nothing. You have no money. You can't say, well, I want my attorney because you don't have an attorney. And the way a public defender works is you go to jail, you get interrogated, you get mercifully drilled by detectives, you show up to your first day of court, and then some fucking guy 
in a old cheap suit walks in and says, I'm your public defender. Where were you the entire time of my arrest leading up to this point when I was interrogated, when I was put through the rigors of the detectives, where was my public defender when I was going through all of that shit? And as a low income person, you can't say it. I want my attorney. I guess you probably can, even if you, I don't know how long that will hold. If you, they, yeah. if you say, I want my attorney and they say, who is it? And you say, well, I don't fucking have one. And if they keep dr- drilling you or if they have to wait until you have a public defender, which I don't think it works that way. They're not going to wait until you have a public defender because you don't get your public defender until it's too goddamn late. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a bit of a loophole for law enforcement, I do believe, whenever someone can't afford an attorney. That's why I'm glad my wife works for a really good attorney. <laughs> <laughs> it's my money and I want it now. <laughs> J.G. Moore. Wait, is that him? Yeah, it is. Okay. Hmm. 877 cash now. Something like that. Yeah, that's it. Oh, Jesus. One anonymous witness interviewed by the Guardian said she was taken there and interrogated inside of a cage. She was in the facility for eight to ten hours before she was taken to another location for processing. She also said she was never offered to speak to her attorney. Hmm, Okay. An attorney by the name of Rajiv Bajaj was allowed into Holman Square in 2006. So this this attorney made it in. Okay, okay. He was there to visit one of his clients that had been arrested. The officers made him wait for over an hour to see his client. Hmm. Okay. He did speak about how there it's there was a very secretive nature to the officers at the station, and it all seemed overwhelmingly odd to him, the way they were kind of whispering and the looks he was getting. And, quote, when I got there, there were two prosecutors questioning, knowing fully that I was down there to see him, uh, Baji said. When I walked in, they seriously walked away acting like they weren't speaking to him or anything. It's typical Chicago police, typical Holman Square, typical Cook County prosecutor's office. Hmm. Right. So apparently this doesn't, this reaches beyond Holman Square. I guess it's a, and just on the radio today, I was listening and there was someone on the radio. I listen to WLW based out of Cincinnati. Yeah. I always listen to that state. They Mm -hmm. have the Reds. You know, I always listen to it, but there was someone on there and she used to live in Chicago and she was talking about the politics and she's like, you know, everybody knows that Chicago politics are corrupt. You just, you just deal with it. And I'm just like, is that really what it's like there? You just, you know, the public officials are corrupt and you know, they're doing fucking bad shit and everyone just turns a blind eye to it. Is that the way? Cause I mean, it's no different than the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, it's all like that. Everybody's bought and fucking sold by the rich people anyways. Yeah. Yeah. But just the fact that the culture is, yep, they're doing bad shit, whatever. I think that whenever speaking about our federal government, when someone's doing bad stuff, I feel like they get called out for it by the people, at least. Maybe not necessarily their their, their equals, you know, the other people working with them. I think they get called out by the, the general public a little bit. Yeah, but I mean, what the? F- that's not going to do anything. No, it'll never do anything. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's just a... Look at our look at our fucking president now. <laughs> yeah. He's a fucking Twitter gladiator. He really is. He's the <laughs> baddest Twitter gladiator this land has ever seen. I know. Another prosecutor, I'm sorry, another anonymous person interviewed by The Guardian said he was briefly held at Holman Square. He was one of 19 people out of over 7,000 that turned himself in to Holman Square. Ooh. So this guy turned himself in there. I think the, fucked up. the article calls him Jose, but that is actually not his name. Probably not, yeah. An anonymous informant officers named Chewy told officers that he was sold marijuana from a man at Jose's address. And Jose was the one that turned himself in. I can't wait for marijuana to be decriminalized. <laughs> no, it's think, so fucking silly. I think it is in Chicago now. Yeah, it should be. Officers conducted a guns drawn <clears throat> search warrant a few days later, not looking for Jose, but looking for a tall man described by okay. Chewy. All right. Jose was not home at the time, but his wife was, along with his 10-year-old daughter, who had a friend over at the house at the time, as they were working on a school project together. Police took over $10,000 in cash from the home and a substantial amount of marijuana. The arrest report lists that they took $4,600, even though Jose claims there was over $10,000 missing. The arrest report says a little over $4,600. 
$4,500 was taken. I feel like he would know how much of his cash was taken. <laughs> yeah. Jose's attorney accompanied him when he went to Holman Square, and he told the officers as they were taking him in that Jose would be answering no questions. Look good. My garage is closing. It just scared the fucking poop I was out wondering of what that was. I heard yeah, that. It closes at 10 o'clock. Ah, oh, I gotcha. <laughs> so all you motherfuckers out there. <laughs> trying to sneak in here. Yeah. At some point, Jose took a Xanax. And in my... Uh, Jose, come on. <laughs> in my research, <laughs> I can't figure out for the life of me if it was his Xanax or if they just <laughs> flipped him a Xanny or how that happened. Um, And I'm... I'll get to it at the end of the episode, but Xanax is bad for me. <laughs> okay, whatever. I mean, any word that's spelled the same front ways or backward, backwards is fuck, fuck going to fuck you up. <laughs> and after after he took the Xanax, he fell asleep. He was woke up by the loud banging on the door to someone yelling, are you going to help yourself? Which is the famous fucking dying words. I told you guys not to heed from an officer or a detective. He says, what do you mean help myself? And the officer says, the detective says, are you going to talk to me? And he says, no, nah, my lawyer was just here. You could have just said this in front of my lawyer. I know my rights. And Jose goes on to say he wasn't trying to hear it. He was just blabbing away like, oh, you think you're smart ass this and that. And Jose also says, that's what they do, man. They get people who don't know their rights. Jose continued. That's probably how they came upon me in my house. Probably someone ended up talking to them and they dry snitched on me. All I knew was that I lived there. They squeeze people and then they go get somebody else. That's what they do. In my mind, what they're trying to achieve here is it's so complicated. You know, I, I see it from both sides here that there has to be a certain veil of secrecy, but then there's so much documented fucked up shit going here. It it just sounds like they're trying to find the head of the snake. You know what I mean? To cut off that head for a little bit of weed for, for weed. Yeah, right. Exactly. Jesus Christ, man. While performing their investigation, a journalist from The Guardian arrived at the warehouse, or Holman Square. They arrived at the warehouse gatehouse. The journalist was refused entry at that point. The man who was stationed at the guardhouse wouldn't answer any questions, only saying this is a secured facility. The uh, guard at the guardhouse went on to say, you're not even supposed to be standing here. He refused to give his name. Hmm. Which begs the question, do police, in a lot of these uh, First Amendment videos, the people say, name and badge number. Give me your name, your fucking badge number. Yeah. And usually the cops will <clears throat> not say anything, or sometimes they'll say, I'm Officer Dickweed, badge number <laughs> 69, suck my fucking cock. 69420. Whatever. Yeah. So I did a little bit of research. Um, there are exceptions in to whether or not a police officer has to give you their name and badge number. Um, in most instances, it varies by department. Mm-hmm. So some, some departments say that if you are asked to identify yourself, you have to present your name, your identification, right. your business card will work. My favorite line is, you're a public official, you work for me. <laughs> That's that's <laughs> this is the quickest way to piss them off. That's how yeah exactly. Oh, so fucking stupid. <laughs> they get so pissed. But then I also just as a this is from the Seattle Police Department uh, it says the exceptions employees are not required to identify immediately identify if an investigation is jeopardized, a police function is hindered, or if there is a safety consideration. That's understandable. That is a broad veil that mm-hmm. they can use to be able to say, you don't need to know my motherfucking name. You can take my badge and shove it in your dick hole. And, and that's, yeah, and, and those th- those are completely intentional just so they can make that broad blanket statement. <laughs> yeah. And they can claim anything, which in those those three those three instances, I would say I could completely understand that giving your information, you know, if there's a safety consideration. Well, and that, that goes on. Uh, some people like to, uh, go get their dick sucks by prostitutes. I don't <laughs> recommend doing that. No, definitely not. That's a good way to make your dick fall off. 
Find a good wholesome lady. And I don't want, as a listener of this show, don't want your dick to fall off. I, Rob, I don't want your dick to fall off. Oh, I hate for that to happen. If your dick did fall off, I would want you to come here and have it happen here because I would want to see what happens when someone's okay. dick falls off. Just all gangrenous and <laughs> it looks like a old toenail. <laughs> Just stinky and falling off. You're like, Nick, we've been friends for a long time, but you're not going to believe what my dick looks like right now. <laughs> I can come out these cracks in the side of it. It looks like tree bark. <laughs> it looks like Jack Link's jerky. <laughs> oh, dude, that would be rough. <laughs> I left a Slim Jim out for a couple of weeks. I got fucking beef jerky dick. <laughs> have you ever made your own beef jerky? Uh, No, I have not. Listen to this horrible story. Let's get sidetracked for a second. <laughs> sure, we haven't done it that much here. Right. About the time that I was moving out of my parents' house, there was a large tiered cookie holder okay in my kitchen my mom makes some bomb ass shit Uh uh-huh this lady can fucking throw down my dad says their first night that they were together she made dinner he said this bitch made tuna and corn and he said (laughs) i could not eat the shit i said what the fuck is going on but he said from that moment on she gave her entire being to becoming an incredible cook and my mom can throw down in the kitchen okay Mm -hmm. So my fat ass is walking to the kitchen. <laughs> I see this tier of no bake cookies just sitting there. Okay, it looks like a parking garage. I'm spinning parking garages that nice. goes up, and I'm like, I'm about to eat all these goddamn things because I will eat the shit out of some no bake cookies. <laughs> I only fuck around, dude. They're yeah. delicious. So I grab one, put it in my mouth, <laughs> I spit it out. I'm like, that is fucking disgusting. As soon as I say that, my little brother walks in. He's like, (laughs) (laughs) and I said, what the fuck is that? He's like, oh, man, I'm just putting together some shit. I'm making some deer jerky. (laughs) Deer jerky? What the fuck is that, dude? (laughs) And he was an outdoorsman. Yeah. yeah. I was a Sega kid. I was in the house. He was outside. I took care of the inside of the kingdom. Of the castle. <laughs> he took care of the fucking moat. Okay? That's how we grew up together. <laughs> the moat. The house. The yard was trashed. The inside was managed by me. That's how we grew up. He said, there were fucking deer jerky, you fat fuck. And I just ate a big mouthful of it. And, uh. So that was before it was dried up? Bef- he just put the. Just put it in there? It was still, like, mushy, but nice. still kind of together. Yeah. Oh, man. It was yeah. disgusting. And then another incident of mistaken identity i mowed the grass and i came inside and i uh, opened up the fridge there's a huge bucket clear bucket of orange gatorade or orange kool-aid mm-hmm. and dude i will get down on some fucking kool-aid Fuck yeah orange kool-aid i'll drink all of it right now and i just got done mowing the grass i'm oh, sweating yeah, you're parched and it's it's just glistening it's just sugary sweating. goodness yeah. and i grab it and i just pick the whole thing up i just like I take about a third of the top off. Like, dude, it's probably a two gallon jug. And I take like the top third off. I'm like, <sighs> and I hear my mom like, because when she starts laughing really hard, it sounds like a yeah. fucking dog getting fucked. <laughs> and she's like, Rrr, Rrr, Rrr. Uh, and I'm like, it's 150 degrees outside. I'm like, what the fuck are you laughing at? I look out in the living room. She's like, Ooh. Did you drink that? I said, yeah, I drank it. It's good shit. I feel drank a, lot, a third of it. I feel a lot better. <laughs> she said, oh, I'm going to drink that for my colonoscopy. <laughs> I said, you're what? <laughs> she said, I'm going to use that to clean my butt out. <laughs> How bad did you shit afterwards? <laughs> was it like horrible? I thought I was good. <laughs> she, I said, How much are you, are you supposed to drink that? She said, I was supposed to drink half of that, and I drank almost half of it in one like uh, one gulp. And for anyone that's had a colonoscopy done, they're fucking laughing right now at me. So for like two hours, I'm good. I'm thinking, all right, I'm a big motherfucker. This yeah. I didn't inject enough of this to hurt me. But then, dude, like a voice from heaven, my stomach is like, oh, Fuck you! And I go to the toilet, dude. I swear to God, I felt like the your bowels just jump out of your body. A million serpents, a million <laughs> devil tongues shooting out of my fucking asshole. You know that sun that chases you around in yeah, Mario? Yeah, and Mario. To sw- it felt like one of the like a swarm of those was flying out of my butthole. 
and it was raising me up uh, off the toilet. I was shitting broccoli that I ate back in the late 80s, dude. It fucking cleared me out so bad. I was shitting like a goose. It was disgusting, and it was not solid poop. It was right, it right. was at first, but then by the end, I could have shit through a screen, like a fucking screen window, and not touched a wire. You, you were pissing out of your ass. It at that was point. miserable. My mom's like, <laughs> she's laughing at me. Yeah. <laughs> So what are you laughing at? <laughs> Fuck me up, dude. Oh, man, I bet. Poop my pants. I didn't get any poop in my underwear that day either. Oh, I bet not. Proud moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, All liquid, man. I know at some point in my life, due to my diet and my health, I know I'm going to get a colonoscopy. Yeah. And when he says, well, you're going to need to drink this, I'm going to know exactly what the fuck it's all about. You got to go mow the lawn beforehand. I know and- <laughs> what to do. You're just going to have a good time. I know what to do to take it down. <laughs> they're push mowing that bitch. Yeah, there you go. Oh. In uh, January of 2013, one man had his name changed in the Chicago Central Bookings database and then taken to the Holman Square without a record of his transfer being kept, according to the uh, Eliza Solwege, Solwege of Chicago's First Events Legal Aid. Uh, she found out where he was after he was taken to the hospital with a head injury. Hmm. But he they changed his name when they moved him. That's fishy. A little sketchy. Quote, he said that the officers caused his head injuries in an interrogation room at Holman Square. I had been looking for him for six to eight hours, and every department member I talked to said that they had never heard of him. He sent me a phone pic of his head injuries because I had seen him in a police station right before he was transferred to Holman Square without any... Well, it it cut off right there, but I'm assuming it's without uh, being advised. Any notification, yeah. Any notification there. Bartums... Is that his name? Bartums? Another Chicago attorney said that in September of 2013, she got a call from a mother worried that her 15-year-old son had been picked up by a pol- by police before dawn. A sympathetic sergeant followed up with the mother to say her son was being questioned at Holman Square in connection to a shooting and would be released soon. When hours passed, Bartums traveled to Holman Square only to be refused entry for nearly an hour. An officer told her, well, you can't just stand here taking notes. This is a secure facility. They're undercover officers, and you're making people very nervous. <laughs> she was at that point told to leave. She said she would return in an hour if the boy was not released. He was home and not charged after 12, maybe 13 hours Holy in custody. Holy shit. First off, that's a juvenile. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. <laughs> You cannot do that without oh, a parent. Holman Square, or Chicago PD, you can. It doesn't fucking matter what you do. Yeah. On February 2nd, 2013, John Hubbard was taken to Holman Square. Hubbard never walked out again. Uh, the Chicago Tribune reported that the 44 year old was found, quote, unresponsive inside an interview room hmm. and pronounced dead. After publication, the Cook County Medical Examiner told The Guardian that the cause of death was determined to be heroin intoxication hmm right i bet there wasn't any heroin in that facility uh, either this is from the actual narrative from the incident it's oh this is a different this is a different story altogether okay it says uh, the, the officer's report here this is another the incident that happened this where, some really good handwriting yeah this, i like this yeah this guy knows what the fuck he's doing <laughs> it says in summary while in custody victim uh, having one left hand cuff to the wall with a flex cuff, managed to put another flex cuff around his neck. Hmm. The police officer working the desk heard a scream come from a holding cell. After investigating, finds victim unconscious. Police officer calls 911 and is assisted by police officer Blank, who is walking by. Police officer Blank observes victim with our with one left hand flex cuff to the wall and the other flex cuff around neck slumped over with head down. Police officer Blank retrieves a cutter and immediately removes both flex cuffs. Victim soon regains consciousness after flex cuff from neck is removed. Victim is taken to Mount Sinai, which is a hospital there. How the fuck did they get that other flex cuff is what I'm wondering. (laughs) Who fucking tries to... And the here's the cop just like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna flex cuff you to the wall. Here's this extra flex cuff. Do what you want with it. And this is the quote from the guy that was flex cuffed. He says, "All I remember is waking up on the floor of the cell 
and them saying that I tried to kill myself. I was taken to the hospital and was told it would be in my best interest wow. to go along with the story. So being afraid, I did as I was told. Which leads me to believe. Wow. Was fucking choked out with a flex cuff. Definitely. Because he was not giving the officers the information they wanted. Definitely. So wow. That, that concludes all the research from the Holman Square <sighs> Chicago Police Corruption. Ooh, man. You want to talk about a fucked up police department, dude. Yeah, that's fucked. There's so much underhanded bullshit going man. on here. And this doesn't even skim the surface of probably all the other stuff there. But then again, hats off to all the men and women at the Chicago Police Department that are wading through the muck, doing the shit the right way, fighting the good fight. You know, trying to make a difference in a community that doesn't probably necessarily want you to make a difference. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. But like I said, those guys are the real heroes. <laughs> hats off to the motherfuckers doing it the right way. Yes. Hats off to my mom for making me drink that <laughs> gallon of colonoscopy drink that nearly took my fucking life as a young adolescent. That was a that was the cream spot right there. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that was the definite cream spot. For about 48 hours. Ooh, wee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The OG cream spot. So stick around for the interview with the Patreon sponsor of this episode, Brandon yeah. Party. Yeah. He's anonymous, though. He, go, he goes anonymous <laughs> halfway through the interview. We gave him that courtesy. Yeah. If you would like to join us on Patreon, go to patreon.com slash podcast. We have another episode coming up this week. I yeah. I don't know if we're going to record it tonight. I need to go to bed, Rob. That's fine. I got to go to bed. That's fine. Well, we can do it. Probably Wednesday then. Yes. Wednesday. I don't he hasn't told me what he's covering. It might be no. a secret. Yeah. No, it's not a secret, but we'll figure that out on Wednesday. Okay. I'm excited for it. Thanks so much for tuning in this week. Uh and stick around for the interview with Brandon Partey. Hey. Yeah, thank you guys. Love you. I don't love you. I do love you. <laughs> I love you more. All right, we're here with this episode's Patreon sponsor. We're not going to the party. We're bringing the party to you, Brandon Party. Thanks for sponsoring this episode. How are you doing, pal? I'm good, my dudes. How are you? We so I guess yeah. that's We just got done butt fucking the shit out of each other. Yeah, I don't feel good. <laughs> it's a lot of weight to have on your back. I have the biggest dick, but I got shallow assholes. So, <laughs> so I always, my mom used to say that about my dad. She said he couldn't hit the bottom, but he could blow out the sides of a tuna can. <laughs> So, Brandon, you and I spoke earlier this week, and yeah. you started giving me some topics. You pretty much, you were, you've you probably been the easiest patron to work with. You just said, do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> <laughs> but then you gave me a few ideas to go with, and we reached something. When you initially told me about this topic, Holman Square, I thought these motherfuckers, 7,000 of them just disappeared like they couldn't find the guys. But... <laughs> They were they found. <laughs> they're physically they're physically they've been found, but they were disappeared in the law enforcement system. So it's kind of a you know a little bit oh, so different. The, the internet lied is what you're telling me. Not really. Not not they. It's a it's a strange story. There's a lot of atrocities. We're probably going to get murdered for this episode because we're really. Um, I'm glad we don't live in Chicago. But this. It really centers around the atrocities and the corruption in the, at the Chicago Police Department. <laughs> there is a lot of it. There's a fuck ton of it. Yeah. And you, so I appreciate you getting us killed and getting us put up, put us on, on, on another watch list. So. It wasn't you. It was I, else. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all about risking it for the biscuit. You know, we got to get it to happen. Uh, there is. So you and I sp spoke a little bit, and we are going to. Cover. We haven't recorded the episode yet, but we are going to be pretty in depth with this. We're going to cover all the nooks and crannies like we always do. And when you and I were speaking, you kind of told me about some other stuff that, you, <laughs> that has gone on with you, and that has nothing to do with true crime. More like, are you comfortable with telling us what part of the country you live in for our audience uh, of thirteen people? Yeah, well, like all, all twelve of them out there plus me. We uh, we we like you, but um, thank you. Uh, I'm out in like the Portland area, the Vancouver, Washington. For those who know where that is, it's it's nothing. And you are in a hot spot for the one and only Bigfoot. Am I correct? 
Oh, buddy. Me, me and all my other, all my neighbors, well, we're big believers. Big believers. Is it, have you lived out there your entire life? Uh, my adult life, yeah. I was out in uh, Wisconsin for a while eating cheese. Wisconsin. And now Dude, I'm back. I get, anytime I go to a restaurant and they have cheese curds as an appetizer, I get them. Yeah. But oh, then I oh, talked man. to a friend I met that was, that is from Wisconsin, and he said, the only way you're eating good cheese curds is if they're squeaking when you're chewing on them. Yep. <laughs> I never knew this. Yeah. I just want to fart just hearing about it. <laughs> just fart, dude. It's free. No, this is... I've been farting all day and I'm burning calories. This you don't is... even know. This is Planet Bro Ohio Fitness. This is a no. This is a judgment free zone. There's no lunk alarms. You can do whatever you want, man. Oh, I got one of those ab blaster things that like squeezes your stomach. That's why I told Rob I, I was out. doing to him when he got here. I was like, lay on the table. We're gonna do an ab blaster. <laughs> <laughs> But then halfway through it, I Nick, I changed it to an ass blaster. <laughs> oh man, I've been farting my ass off yeah. ever since I got this thing, and it won't stop. That's all right, man. That's okay. You just got to work through it. Job interview, and I'm stoked. Okay, I'm gonna fart everywhere. <laughs> you guys are wearing tu- tuxedos to an interview that requires you to clean toilets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you um. You expressed to me that you do a lot of hiking, a lot of outdoors type stuff. Obviously, I don't. I fucking hate the outdoors because there's no Wi-Fi. Oh, no, you you look you look great. Don't don't even. <laughs> Thank you. Don't, don't don't say that about yourself. You look great. And you said that um, to be more specific, you ha- actually had some run-ins with what you believe to be some type of cryptid or maybe a Bigfoot. Is that correct? I mean, I don't know. Like I, like I told you the other day. I don't know what the fuck I saw. Okay, you you, then, had, you told I, I, me a really weird story, and all I remember, because I, I was driving, and you, you told me the story, and at the end, you're like, "There's a fucking guy," and I was like, "Oh man, that was a wild story." So <laughs> why don't you why don't you take me through this kind of weird fucking shit that happened to you? I don't know how recent it was. It was about two weeks ago. Well, okay, let me preface good. this by saying, fresh. When we talked the other day. This is fresh. I was very high, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> When we talked in the fog, I wasn't expecting your call, and I had eaten a bunch of edibles, and I was chilling, and then I was like, oh, shit, Nick's calling me. Cool, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> so, yeah, I started talking really fast, and I told you a story, but it's a cool story. So, no, man, let's go through it real quick. Are you high right now? <laughs> no. Well, I got to go to this job interview, so no. Okay. <laughs> well, let's get you um, through this so you can land this fucking job, dude. Oh, buddy, just wait. I'm going to land it. Um, but, uh, no, I'm driving the other day and I was like kind of the back, like backwards area by my house. And it was like, uh, I just saw this, like kind of was coming on this corner. There's no street lights or nothing. And I saw this weird light, like kind of come down from the sky, but I don't know if it was my headlights hitting something or whatever the fuck I saw, but it was like, I'm trying to still trying to explain it to myself. So I'm like, that was fucking weird. So you're driving, right? But uh, I'm driving. Yeah. Okay. And it's like, so I'm coming around this turn. It's a left-hand turn. Um, and uh, I'm in a Subaru Forester. I'm going to paint this little picture for you. And uh, so I'm coming around the turn, and I see this light kind of like, it was like a really dim, like oval-shaped thing kind of like came like, straight to the ground. And was it coming and from it, above like, you? or Like above, yeah. It was like, so if I'm looking ahead, it was probably like at 50 yards away. And you couldn't and, really tell where it was, what it was emanating from. Yeah. I just like, I was talking to my buddy on the phone, and then I was like, what the fuck am I looking at? And then I freaked out. And I was like, whoa, dude, you got any, I just freaked, what the fuck did I see? Oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, then uh, as I'm coming around the turn, so I see the light, like, come towards the ground. And I'm like, what the fuck was that? And then at the corner, exactly where the light, like, where it looked like the light came down, there's this guy just standing there with his back to me. But he was just standing. Like, there's, he's not looking at his phone, not looking at it. He's just standing there. What, and, like, there's no, there's no houses around there. There's no, like, there's no reason for this guy to just be standing there. Jesus. So, I don't know what I was looking at. I'm not saying what anything what what it was, but it was fucking weird. That seems a little uh, weird. Was yeah, he naked? Was, was, odd. was he naked? Uh, no. No. I mean, I, well, we can only wish. Do you have a like a like a, maybe a description of what he possibly looked like? I mean, he was a guy. Um, <laughs> I mean, I would say a f- five ten to five eleven skin complexion from pale to dark. Um, it was. He, he, <laughs> The fucking guy. I don't know. Was he, he look like he was in ratty clothes or anything? Or oh, he was. He, he was wearing like yeah, normal clothes. Kind okay. of like yeah, he was just wearing like a hoodie kind of thing. But it was like, like it. It was just weird that he was just standing with his back to me. Yeah. I don't know. It, 
again, like even now I'm saying that I'm like, I sound like an idiot. This, this is that, no, that was the, just a guy standing there, and I, and I saw a light. That's it. That's all. I it was. eat this stuff up, man, because when stuff <laughs> like this happens to people, they're just like, no one is going to believe this. No one is ever going to take this as a true story. And I've had stuff happen to me before, and I know full goddamn well that what happened in front of my eyes is exactly as I saw it. But when I tell the story, it sounds so far fetched and crazy that it it's almost embarrassing to tell the story. Exactly. Now that I'm being recorded, it sounds fucking stupid. <laughs> no, it is stupid, man. But we really, I'm just kidding. No, I, I think it's pretty wicked. No, it sounds cool, right? It sounds really cool. <laughs> what would have been Tell real, me how cool the story is. It's just um. Well, not only is that that area out there to, to be more specific, a yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Sorry, we gotta stop there. We found out that Rob's microphone was not recording this entire time. Yeah, it's okay. Rob contributed a lot to that conversation. <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> and you guys will never know. The best part is they're gonna hear in the beginning where I just talk about repulsively having sex with you, and you yeah. they can't even really hear what you're it's saying. A, it's okay to defend yourself. Yeah, I'm sure they'll be able to hear a little bit of me and your mic, but I don't care. It's fine. It's, it's fine, okay. Brandon. Brandon, this is for oh, you. Yeah. Okay, buddy. Hey. Wow. Just wow. Wow. <laughs> As, aside from what happened with this incident with this guy that, I guess, in my opinion, that could be a lot of different shit, man. That could just be exactly yeah. what it is. Just some guy standing there, or you could have honestly, <clears throat> there's so many different theories that Rob and I read about that are so cool as far as like, Parallel universes and all kinds of, uh, you know, alien abductions and shit like that. And just doppelgangers. There's absolutely no way to tell what the fuck that was. If you saw lights coming and the lights was possibly coming from this guy, maybe it was just some dickhead with a flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, that's what I, but my brain is telling me that's what it was. But it's like at the same time, I was like, mm. dude, what the fuck did I see? Because like, that was weird. Like it made me feel weird. I think it was something a lot cooler uh, than that. I would have sucked his dick. We know. The <laughs> microphone was on for that one. Oh, yeah, of I'm course it was. <laughs> I mean, I would have done that. <laughs> I thought it was still off. Now, in your, your infinite travels, is there has there been any, any other kind of suspicious story I mean, or sus- I, sus- anything weird you've oh. stumbled upon? I mean, uh, so, I mean, I got one, but it's like it's one of those ones where I'm like, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it. But I'm going to tell you anyway, because fuck, fuck it. Yeah, those are the best uh, ones. I was going to so, say, those are the best ones. We'll change your voice, Brandon. Yeah. <laughs> Good, yeah, yeah, can you make me give, like, give me a really high-pitched girl voice? Or, I, no, I don't even know. Something no, cool, we like are. Right, I will. Right, right this part, I'm going to make you. I'm going to give you a girl voice. <laughs> Rob will do it, because I suck at everything on yeah, this computer. Yeah, I got it. Oh, shit, yeah. Okay, so, um, are we ready? Yeah, dude, fucking go. Lay it on us. Uh, oh, fuck, I'm, I'm going to do it, dude. Here we go. Okay. So, um, I was in the Navy. I just got out a couple years ago. And, uh, Thank you for your service, Brandon. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, God, you stop. <laughs> You're a better um, man than us. But, uh, no, shut the fuck up, you guys, okay? I'm telling a story now, okay? I agree. <laughs> this is being, you're being very disrespectful to the veterans, okay? This is for them. This is what you paid for. Um, <laughs> but uh, so when I was working on the flight deck, uh, it was one night I was out in, I think we were like, Bahrain or some shit, like, out in the middle of butt fuck nowhere. I'm sorry, did you say and, uh, working on a guy's dick, or did you say working on uh, the flight deck? On the flight, well, both. <laughs> okay, working on the flight deck. Okay, yes. Good. Um, so, uh, we're sitting up on the flight deck, and, uh, we see this light, like, you know how, like, a flight deck looks with the, the tower in the middle with the, all the lights on it, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So, there's, uh, this light in the sky, and we're, we're like, the only ones up there, and we're kind of just doing night bullshit stuff, just sitting around, and we see this light, like, kind of come across the sky and we're like what the fuck is that like that's not an afterburner like i know what an afterburner looks like and that's not an afterburner and we kind of see it and kind of goes around and we lose it uh but it kind of goes behind the tower and you kind of lose it to the uh, the lights and i'm like okay cool what the fuck was that and it comes back around again and then now there's the light and then two jets like sitting above it and i'm like well, okay well there's two afterburners there's a light what the fuck is that light and it comes around the ship again and then we lose it in the lights and as it comes back around the third time, there's now five jets on it, and this light is just kind of like coasting across the sky, and we're like, dude, what the fuck are we looking at? We're all kind of looking at each other like, what the fuck are we looking at right now? And as this thing makes its like third big pass around, it just disappears. It's just oh, gone. Man. Like, no bullshit. Nice. 100%. Like, yes, like, the, the shit I saw in the corner, that was, what I, that was whatever. This was some shit. 
<laughs> we, I mean, we all looked at each other and we're like, did you just fucking see that? Yeah, did you fucking see that? What? I fucking saw it. Did you see that? What do you think it was? Um, uh, man, I, that could be, that's up in the air for anything. Okay. But where the story gets weird is, like, we're all sitting, like, we stuck around the ship. We're telling everybody, oh, fuck, we saw this shit last night. It was crazy. Saw this, that, and the other. And everyone's like, oh, dude, that's fucking crazy. That's bullshit. No one cares. Like, whoa, whoa. And I'm like, dude, no, it was crazy. Um, like a week later, the fucking MPs come up and they're like, hey, you, you, and you, come with us. You guys sign these papers. Oh, shit. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? And they're like, it's a, you know, non disclosure. You won't talk about this with anybody. And I'm like, thank you. Uh, yeah, okay, here we go. <laughs> and uh, I got mad told fucking everybody. Good. Because yeah. it's just, yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I oh, hope someone comes knocking on my door. Like, that would just more validation. Disclosure, man. Full disclosure. That's uh, what we're, that's what we're oh, all yeah. waiting for. God, that's uh, pretty fucking wicked. But oh, fucking wicked, dude. Like crazy <sighs> ass shit. Because it was like, oh, fuck, we, we saw something, dude. We fucking saw something. But did these like, MPs that set you down, did they try and tell you what you saw? Like try to make up your not, mind for you? Say you saw um, uh, a, was it a weather balloon. That's what always, that's what people always say. Uh, not at all. No, they were just straight up like, you didn't see anything. You won't talk about it. This is it. You're signing here. I'm like, all right, I'm did, signing here. Did you I have to talk about it? Did you have to to submit a report or anything initially that night of the incident? No. They just, they, I mean, they just like immediately made it sound like no one saw it, and like so the, the jets that we saw weren't part of our ship because they didn't take off from our ship. Yeah. So it's like like I don't know where those jets came from, but or if they were something. even jets, could you even tell one hundred percent that they were jets? Oh yeah, no, you, you can see like the, the afterburners kind of yeah, a little yeah, corona yeah. thing, yeah. But there was a third. Yeah, yeah. There was like a third something in the sky. Yeah, and it, yeah. I mean it was a ball of light, like kind of where it was like a circle. Was it moving? Not, like, you know, it, how quickly was it moving? It, slow as shit. Like <laughs> you were, but you could tell the jets were kind of like not knowing how to, uh, you know, how to track it, kind of thing. It's weird. It was fucking. It was weird, man. I'm gonna say it. It's <clears throat> definitely a UFO. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> dude. Like when I say when I say this thing disappeared, it fucking it was just gone. Like it just it was there, and then it wasn't there. That's sweet. That's so much fun. Fucking crazy shit, dude. Like I wish I could say I've seen more shit than that, but no, that that's, was like, that's perfect. That was some shit. You yeah. didn't get the shit beat out of you. Now, but <laughs> that's perfect. I mean, yeah, the shit beat out more times than I can count. But that was uh, yeah, that was pretty fucking dope. You're gonna wake up tomorrow morning. There's gonna be that disclosure you signed that someone just slid it under your door. <laughs> Don't want to be like a oh, tiny ass down my bed, like, hey, buddy. Dude, I would shit. shit. Oh no. You've seen that meme on Facebook that says, "Uh, you wake up in the middle of the night and Amazon Prime's putting your pajamas on you." Yeah, and you're like, yeah. Shh, that's <laughs> Prime now. <laughs> Well, Brandon, that's some good shit, man. I'm glad we, um, I'm, I hope we do your topic, um, justice there. Cause there's no, a lot of, I hope, I hope you do. there's a lot of injustice in what the Chicago police department, what they're doing. And I'm not much of an, I don't like to be the people's voice or an advocate for the people that are being abused or whatever. Maybe we should start doing that. Certainly. <laughs> Something. Yeah, that sounds stupid. It, does, it is stupid, <laughs> and I can understand how people get burned up about this stuff, uh, about you know just the way people are mistreated by local governments and stuff. And I, I'm sorry, and I've said this a lot. I don't have any political leanings at all, and I couldn't give a fuck less about anything that doesn't happen outside the four outside the four walls of my house. But reading through this and seeing the atrocities committed by one specific police department and having. Uh, our law enforcement backgrounds it just makes you say, man, God, Jesus fucking Christ. These guys are horrible. What kind of people are they hiring there? So, yeah, no, that's like when I was like going through, uh, I was doing my own little research and diving deep. And it was like, it's, there's not a whole lot out there. And that's what kind of like weirds me out more is like, yeah, what the fuck is actually going on there? And what I kind of looked at is the, the story, the pattern, not just this specific incident, but the pattern of the department itself over the, the past few decades, all the shit they've done. So, it's more than just the Holman Square disappearances. Oh, yeah. It's, I, I, I was listening to this thing today. It was talking about, like, if they're doing this here, what's happening in Detroit or New York yeah, or yeah. Vancouver, Washington? You, you never fucking know. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, you know, it's like. I just want yeah, to. I, yeah. I want to get pulled over once, and I want the cop to walk up with a billy club and knock my tail light out. <laughs> I want oh, that God, to happen yeah. to me. I would fucking love that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we're about to I mean, rumble, they, fat boy. We, 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 didn't, we didn't get that shit out here. I remember one time I got pulled over at, like, 15 or 16. It was, like, my buddy and I just finished, like, hotboxing my car. 
And like we pulled out, Fred went out on the main road, got pulled over like almost immediately, smoke still rolling out the windows. And he comes up the window and doesn't even come all the way up the window. He's like, hey man, your headlights are off. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. <laughs> like, see ya. Oh, I was man. like, oh my God. <laughs> That's great. I, I don't know if we're going to change your voice or not for that story because that story was too good to, to change your voice. <laughs> I don't know. I just don't know, Brandon. It sounded a lot more yeah. credible if he sounded like a like a real high pitched voice. Though. Yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> Fuck it. I got one, one of those. Like, I don't even know the high pitched voice, the low voice. Any yeah. of those robot voices are good. We'll take care of you. We'll take oh, care of you. But yes. Brandon, we wish you nothing but the best at your job interview that you're about to go to. Thanks for pausing a moment to have uh, twenty minutes with us. I hope that it was everything you ever imagined. Oh, it, it was. I met yeah. my heroes. You know, and I. Th- I think we would love to chat with you some other time. I feel like you're full of piss and vinegar and all kinds of fun <laughs> stories. So, I, I'm all for it, man. The number, the the phone. Yeah, is I, I, I got you on the uh, on the on the Facebook now. So yeah, you do. I'm, you I'm can text you all the time. Just jerk off to there. pictures of me and my dogs. <laughs> oh, buddy! Oh, yeah, buddy! You better oh, get them in quick because they're both like 14, so they're gonna die soon. <laughs> Great dogs, oh, shit, but they're so not gonna, they're not gonna live much longer. <laughs> They're both in great what shape. Are doing, what are we doing tonight? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, Brandon, thank you so much, man. Um, do you have any questions for us before we get off the phone here with you? Oh, man. Oh, I mean, I have a lot of questions. First, I mean, where is Bill Wilkins gone? I miss him. <laughs> yeah, I was going to talk um, about him in the beginning of this episode. He's taking a little sabbatical. You never know. Yeah, he's, been, he's been gone for a minute, and I'm just like, oh, I miss my guy. You never know about Bill. Yeah. I used my uh, well, my Facebook password for a minute. I couldn't one. <laughs> now I we like, know. I, need to remember, I needed something to remember, and I was like, oh, Bill Wilkins. Perfect. My name is Bill Wilkins. I'm 73 years old, and I died in my own shit. It's a long one. <laughs> Definitely longer than 10 characters. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Wait, I put a hashtag in there. It was just yeah. 1110. <laughs> okay, I'm going to write this down real quick. <laughs> can we uh, can you confirm that with your credit card number, please? <laughs> Social. It's uh, 4000 yeah. two, two, no, I'm, I'm not giving <laughs> I can't, uh, my credit's so bad, I can't even get a bank account. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I like, Amen, I brother. I got $5 in my account now. Why do you think I'm going to this job interview? Yeah. Well, buddy, uh, we appreciate you. We can't wait to get this done for you and release it tonight on time, just like we're supposed to, so. <laughs> Thank you, good well, sir. I can't wait to listen to it and be, be mad about my own voice and <laughs> feel terrible about it. It's going to be, it's it's gonna be great. Yeah. Wait. It's always the best. You'll really enjoy it. We're not going to edit anything, so. <laughs> oh, good. All right, man. Well, good luck and take care, okay? Right, thanks, man. All right, man. See you guys later. See you. And that's Brandon Partey. Thank you, good sir. Oh, yeah. What a fun what a fun dude. Yeah. He definitely does 69. So <laughs> thank you, Brandon, for sponsoring the episode. Yep. Thank you very much. And I'm so discouraged right now that Rob was gone for. It's okay. 12 no minutes. Deal. 12 minutes. No I'm, big so, deal. I'm sorry. How do we not see that? I don't know. I wasn't paying any attention either. I know. I just let you plug it in and we just went, yeah. went for it. Yep. God damn it. Fucking amateurs. I just shoved it in the hole. I never look which hole I shove it in. So I know. as long gonna, as it gets in, it gets in. It's going to get you in trouble it, it at will. some point. It'll catch up with me one day. Now, um, <clears throat> this is the end of the episode. Yeah, it is. But it's really the beginning of the episode for us. Yeah. So tell them the good news. Yeah. Love you guys. Thanks. <laughs>